Welcome to Quarantine Bar, my man. What can I get for you? Man, it is hot outside and all I can do is mow my lawn. I need something cool and refreshing. What do you got? I'm thinking you need a mojito, buddy. Sounds good. Fire it up. Hey, has anyone ever told you you were a damn good looking bartender? It happens from time to time. Mostly just middle-aged dudes though, but they usually have a sweet beard. I can see that. What do you think, big guy? Best mojito ever? Pretty close. Let me tell you about the best mojito I've ever had. It was a rainy day in Portland, Oregon. And me and my partners in pod were there to interview our buddy James Kirkham, co-founder of Donut Media and Race Service. I was there for a bigger reason though. I was on the trail of the golden mojito, the holy grail of all mojitos. And I had heard that his mom, Kim, was just the person to make that mojito. It took a little bit to convince her, but she finally came around. And let me tell you, she did not disappoint. That mojito was the best. I still think about it. Oh, and talking to James is pretty cool, too. Well, we've just done the longest cold opening ever. Um, and we want to talk to you a little bit about you. Sweet. So, um, guys, James comes to us from the world of, uh, like cars, right? I mean, cars yeah. and media. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, I didn't really know why, but I got pretty hooked at cars actually it comes to a specific moment in my life. I think a lot of us can relate to like, you know, the one being inspired by something. And I remember a moment in my life when I was probably like 12 years old and my dad took me to a racetrack and I saw a car pass by. And I remember that moment like burnt into my skull. Like I want to do that. Yeah. So I got addicted at a young age. Yeah. Here locally? Yeah. At Portland International Raceway before like the, all the racing's getting kind of pushed out. But um, yeah, it was like a, a, a champ car kart race back in the day. And um, I think my dad had worked for Texaco at the time and Mario Andretti and was racing. And um, I remember walking in, we, we had an opportunity to go meet him, but I remember walking into the, to the track and seeing a flash of color fly by and like the loudest noise that you could ever imagine. And it was, I remember seeing like Brazilian flag colors and then seeing a crowd of people with a Brazilian flag, like holding it up and being proud of that person, whoever that was, and that had just like vibrated my whole like existence. Yeah. And, uh, and thinking to myself, I want to make my country proud racing cars and risking my life for a living. So that's started so cool. chasing, chasing that. Yeah, it's been a wild ride. So, um, Obviously, you're not racing now, but that, that, I mean, yeah, I would say really formed kind of maybe who you are. Is that yeah. Yeah. So like the addiction to, to racing, I, I didn't really know how to get into it or what to do to it uh, or to, to get in. And we actually like Nate and I did a lot of indoor karting and go karting here and, and, and the Oregon area. And especially as a kid in Oregon, like, you know, there's not a heck of a lot to do in the, in the winter time when it's pouring down rain and, right. and uh, you want to be inspired. And uh, especially if you're into cars and Luckily, there's an indoor go kart track that we spent a lot of money at, and uh, <laughs> um, got addicted to. And I think and we might be going there later today. That'd be really rad if we make that happen. Let's do it. Oh yeah. Yeah. I brought my helmet. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nate brought his helmet to beat me in front of everybody. He actually. So, yeah. Let's settle this right here and right now. Who, if 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 we're doing uh, a geez, race, that's not fair. If we're doing a race for uh, for Sean's life, who, who who's gonna win this thing? Um, I'm going to say Floyd would probably win this race. Floyd. I knew it. Uh, Floyd, the He's getting some Yorkie. rest for the big race yeah, right he's, now. He's resting up. It's because he's always so chill. <laughs> he's, he's pretending to be chill right now. Yeah. Just wait. Just Gotta wait to pounce cool. on me. Yeah. I can see his eyes. Yeah. But it, it's, it's racing, racing and, and, uh, competitiveness is very much an addiction. And so I, uh, I chased that forever. I, however I could, I, I, I graduated high school and didn't really know how, to, like, it was always something I wanted to do. I, I, I went to LA because I thought there was like more opportunity in LA and um, I was at music business school and um, I, well, I went to a design school for a few weeks and like that left, went to music business school, didn't know what the hell I was there for. But the first day they asked us to get an internship. I'm like, cool, I can get an internship, whatever. And so I like drove to Geffen Records and got an internship with Snoop Dogg. Actually, it was MCA As Records at the does. time. Yeah. Just first, like that. first day in music business school, um, <laughs> uh, internship with Snoop Dogg and his business manager, Frank Cooper. 
and was exposed to that world in a weird way and spent a year doing that and amongst other things i had a few jobs and what, what comes with the before we pass the Snoop Dogg thing, what kind of yeah, comes yeah. with Pump the being an inter intern with, uh, with Snoop? Like, it, what did you do exactly? Not that exciting. I mean, there was definitely exciting moments. Um, sure. You know, I it was it was weird. You know, like I'm, at that point, <laughs> the, the industry would change a little bit, and it wasn't like. But he he was involved in a shooting like my second week. You know, I think somebody he was shot at or something my second week there, and so like feel feel the, like being in the room with those calls be, coming in and like him, his business manager trying to figure out what to, but my job was pretty much like listening to terrible mixtapes of terrible artists that, you know, um, we're, we're sending in. Cause at the time that was how you got signed, right? You sent in all your mixtapes to, right. and then they give an intern, like the, the numb job of just pretending like it's the interns that do that stuff. Yeah. So yeah. in your yeah. interview, were you, uh, judged on how well you could roll a blunt? Um, <laughs> I tried to show them that, but they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't, Frank Cooper, his business manager is very straight laced, and I, I was really disappointed by that. Uh, but I did, I did have to um, um, take care of all their invoicing from different, like the, their recording sessions would be like thousands of dollars of miscellaneous. <laughs> That's the category for blunts. <laughs> yeah. Thousands of dollars of miscellaneous, and then alcohol, and I would have to like sort receipts and and do some basic accounting shit. I don't know. I think they were just like. But anyway, my last day there, mm -hmm. my last day there, there were, I walked into the office and um, Frank's assistant, um, she told me, hey, you know, it was a really interesting time, time in the music industry. Um, so it was MCA Records, the first ever record label in America. Um, what's his name from American Idol? Randy Jackson. Um, Randy Jackson was an A&R. Um, so his office was right in the building. Oh, Across through the door into Geffen was where... Jimmy Iovine was, you know, running 50 Cent's career. 50 Cent was like top of the charts then at Eminem. Um, so it was like that floor was a lot was happening. And Snoop was pretty like pretty small at that point. Like he was big, like he'd already blown up, but he wasn't doing anything very exciting. Like at that point mm -hmm. in his career, he was kind of, you wasn't know, cooking with Martha was, yet. Yeah, it was it wasn't before like super, super, super stardom. He was still like very well known rapper, yeah. but wasn't like. Yeah, he was kind of in a stagnant spot, so it wasn't like somewhere. But between. we were surrounded by Fifty Cent and Eminem, and um, you know, you have Mary, Randy Jackson on the same floor, and I'm like this kid from Beaverton, Oregon, had no idea why I'm in this building doing this. Um, and uh, the last day there, they, uh, they, they, the lady was like, "Hey, uh, will you clean out that office? Um, go ahead and take anything that you want, and also clean that one, and that one, and that one, and just take whatever you want." So I like filled up a box full of random shit. And, um, and she's like, okay, uh, well, MCA was just bought out by Geffen, MCA records, first ever record label in America closed, Jeez. uh, and everybody's fired. So like every, the whole, the whole building emptied and that was my last day in the music industry. Uh, wow. That's yeah. a good lesson. Yeah. And at right. that time I was like, I don't know what I want to do. I want to go race cars for sure. So I moved back up to Oregon. Um, I knew I needed to figure out how to, um, make money. So I started selling real estate. And so within three months, I was kind of, I was, I was licensed and selling real estate at like 19, 20, like I had just turned 20. Um, and, uh, and so I built a race car and then kind of just started chasing that, that goal for the rest of, you know, till now. And it's, it, yeah, it's evolved and into a media business. So media, the media business takes up most of my time right now. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I still, to this day, absolutely love that car. The, well, what, that car what car, what car is it? Uh, it's an E46 M3. Um, it was like 2001. I financed it. Uh -huh. um, uh, uh, it was this was 2006, probably or something, maybe five. Yeah, six I think. or seven. No, was maybe it? seven six. or eight because Maddie uh, was just a baby at that point. And so I financed the race. I financed the car. Perfectly good, beautiful car. Tore it apart. What does the finance company say? Do you tell them that you're no, going to race this no, thing? No, or do you no, like, no. we're actually just going to be driving? And of course, it? like at that time in my life, I'm like financing a very expensive car and I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. I like I'd already leased. So, so I had this, I was told fake it till I make it, you know, sure. early on. Everybody's been told that. I, that stuck with me pretty good. So uh, when I was selling real estate, I just, I had no fucking clue what I was doing. I just pretended like I did. So I, I went and bought, I knew I'd buy a nice suit and I'd watched the music industry like fake it for everything. Right. And oh, yeah. so I took that, what I learned, nobody had websites at the time. So like I built a website uh, or had somebody build a website, a flash website. It was like super like slick and designed. I bought a really expensive suit 
Um, and I financed a Range Rover when I was like 20, 21. And that was my like, that was my currency. I was like, trust me, you know, mm -hmm. I don't have, I can't drink, but yeah, <laughs> no, I wasn't even 21. I definitely was, I was 20 when I was like, so I got licensed when I was 19 and then um, rolled into my twenties. And um, I had a fake ID. So when I, you know, a client would be like, let's go, uh, let's go celebrate or, or let's go like talk over a beer and decide if we should buy this house. I had a fake ID to get into the bar. That's fantastic. Yeah. And I was so embarrassed about like letting the client know that I had no fucking clue what I was doing, but I was very much faking it. And um, did you ever get caught with your fake ID whilst with clients? No, I was very, was, very was nervous about that. So I probably walked into those bars like... <laughs> And my fake ID said like Larry Shirts or something like Larry that. Larry Shirts. <laughs> yeah, I can remember to a T. Larry Shirts actually. Now, no, no, that one was James Curl Cham. Um, when I went, <laughs> so when I went to go, Make when I went there. to go get my fake ID, it was K I R K H A M is my last name. The 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 shady character who had me write my name on a piece of paper in his weird apartment in Vancouver. Um, I wrote. Kirkham, and he came back with a Curl Cham uh, ID, and I was like, I guess I'm James Curl Cham. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Um, so fake it till I make it. And Just the uh Ron Mexico of his time. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was a it was a weird time, but um yeah, uh very much faked it. Sold some real estate, bought a race car, went racing and uh, oh, I say that to say that that was a big thing to like have that much money out in my head. I'm like buying I'm like have this car financed and I'm like, fuck, I hope I can make the payments. And then God forbid I crash it. So every time I'm like racing I had some moments in it, but it was a fun car. It was a uh, yeah. It, so when you say M3, we're talking Beamer, right? Mm -hmm. Did you guys ever see that movie, The Transporter, the first one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Terrible movie, right? Mm -hmm. But the driving scenes in that, like I saw that in theaters when it came out. The, Nothing made me want to buy a Beamer until I saw that movie. And I was just like, oh my God. So, I actually think that's how they pitched that yeah, movie. That was the M5, it's going to be a terrible it? movie. Yeah. But the, there's going to be some that, bitching race car scenes dude, in it. The that way was, he drove that Beamer was so good. Which is a very, very, very pivotal moment in digital content on the automotive space. So that movie yeah. was marketed through BMW Films. BMW Films was the first ever viral anything. I mean, they really started viral content. This was like before E-Bombs World. This was like Streetfire.net age before what? YouTube. Yeah, so BMW wow. Films was the first ever like real thought out branded content series and it was the movie. It was ultimately marketing that movie, but it started as short films. Worked on me. Yeah, it started. It really worked on me too. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was. I remember when I first saw those. I was actually studying for my real estate license, working at Intel, and I was doing night shifts at Intel, doing my real estate license. And I remember watching it. Um, watch watching one of those. It was Madonna was one of the passengers in that, and it was like epic, like short film, and incredible driving scenes, and that kind of like. I guess it's one uh, been been a big impetus into my like media career was was that um, oddly enough mm -hmm. it's, it's funny I get it I yeah. totally get it dude that you got me sucked me in I was like this movie's really it really gets bad in the end but like those driving scenes were so cool with the with the driving like like runs out and they've got to come up with some acting that, that happens you're like <laughs> yeah when the driving stops I'm just like I'm out of here this yeah movie sucks <laughs> yeah yeah the, the, those like the the BMW films was partially the movie storyline but mostly just driving and it was like these little clever shareable mom moments they were like probably like two minutes long and i think one of them was like madonna was picked up by the transporter and and madonna was like a bitchy movie star and uh, like in oh. the back and he was like throwing her around it was clive owen right yeah before he was or no was it jason, uh, jason, jason statham. Statham. that's right same mm -hmm. thing just kidding yeah same guy just uh, but uh jab was before hair. jason statham was known i guess um, yeah and he was the driver in that yeah really just a cool. former diver back then so, really? is that what he did yeah he's an olympic level diver no way yeah interesting turns out he was in a speedo before he was in a car now he's part ninja apparently he's I'll really into damn. like martial arts and and <laughs> yeah he's he, training under uh what's the gosh the old 80s action star with the ponytail Oh, uh, Seagal. Seagal, yeah. 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 Oh, my gosh. Statham's was interesting. He came by our shop the other day, actually. We had a, we had I saw that a talk at the shop. Yeah, it was crazy. I, I wasn't there that day, but um, he was, you know, it's really interesting to have somebody like that in the flesh. And you're like, oh, we're doing something people care about. How tall is he? I wasn't there. I think he's, I don't think he's super tall. Yeah. I would assume probably not. Uh, the, so, a 13-year-old twins, they uh, was trying to, um, show one of them you know some of the, the stuff that we were going to talk about and so we're scrolling through your website and there's a picture of him on there and and uh, that was his like wait a second how tall is that guy because he's you know it's like every action star i thought he was 10 feet I tall know. and bulletproof i know so I think in real life they're mostly pretty 
I think they're camera ready. That's what we call them. Right. Camera ready. <laughs> so, okay. So that movie, um, in its little two minute snippets of, of bitch and mm. race car scenes, uh, or just car scenes. I mean, that kind of shaped the way you guys do business yeah. a little bit, right? Yeah. So our, our so right now we, we own a business, uh, a few different businesses. Um, my time is spent at race service. Um, and we have another one called donut media. Um, we, we, st- so back up a little bit. Um, I was in this, I built this amateur race car and learned to race and realized, okay, this is cool. I can do this. I, w- I want to do this. Now I'm just going to figure it out. So by nature of just having to figure it out, we just were, you know, there's nothing to it, but to do it, I got all these one-liners, but, um, <laughs> really just like that's, that's, that's the truth with anything, right? You just do it. And, um, if you have a good attitude, it pretty much works out. Like, I think if you have the right approach to anything and the right intentions, things, things just work out. And, um, and, and, you know, obviously work ethic and just dumb, you know, walk in stupid every day is one of my favorite sayings, but like dumb, uh, ability to just move forward with what you think too dumb to fail. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good approach. I honestly, it's a good approach. I think, um, the more jaded we get, the older we get, the, 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 uh, the worse we become at like taking risks and, and, and doing what our heart wants us to do or what we want to do in our heart. So, um, anyway, I was, um, um, racing amateur and I, I was accepted into uh, Volkswagen TDI cup, which is a first ever green race series. And, and we had to do, uh, um, a number of things to get into that, but, um, it, uh, uh, got into that series and it opened a lot of doors. Um, it was very challenging in a lot of ways cause I spent a lot of money to get into it. And, um, and it was, it was great. It was like, this to me was like the next progression of this this idea of being in this was a professional racing series with it was televised on espn it was um yeah so it was a big opportunity for me but that um that ultimately like nick woodman the guy who started gopro uh was 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 turned on to the tdi cup as well i think somebody approached him and said hey do you want to sponsor this so the first thing that gopro ever sponsored outside of surfing was the volkswagen jetta tdi cup and that was the the series that i was in so the first race I remember Nick Woodman, the guy who started GoPro, putting cameras on my car before the start of, of, of this, the first race in this series. And literally this like surfer looking dude, total fish out of water, running around with a bag of Ziploc bags. The cameras were only, you know, <laughs> ran for X amount of time, or Ziploc, bat- Ziploc bag full of batteries. And he was changing, like, I remember like the, the one minute warning before the race starts. And he's like frantically trying to put the camera back in the thing. I'm like, what is this thing on my hood? And who is this surfer guy standing in front of me? <laughs> he's, just, he's having his make or break moment oh, right in front of you. Dude. And, <laughs> and that, that, that race ended in calamity. I mean, we, we, everybody crashed each other out. It was like, so perfect you know, for him. Perfect. It was uh, ESPN was covered in all these Volkswagen branded images of cars flipping and going Academy. down the hill and flipping. Uh, it was oh, wild, but fast forward, you know, I, I, I went, you know, back and forth across the country, chasing the career of driving into North Carolina, where I thought the, you know, it's a Hollywood of racing. Yeah. Then the, the economy was starting to crash or crashed and, and it was, it was really challenging, but, um, um, you know, during that challenge of learning that racing is not a financially, um, uh, logical thing to do as a driver, like as a driver, it's, it doesn't make sense unless you're like one of 10 people maybe right now in the world. Cause mm-hmm. it's like they say, the old saying is to make a fortune racing, start with a, start with a, uh, to make a fort for small, a uh, large fortune racing, start with a small fortune. Right. Uh, anyway, it's a good way to lose a lot of money. And I, so I, I spent a lot of money trying to figure that out and I, I, I learned it, but Nick Woodman offered me a job to come help build GoPro back in the first couple of years of the company. So, mm-hmm. um, I, I hung up the racing boots of, uh, you know, taking it really seriously. And you know, in my head, I've never quit racing. I still race and I raced last year in a, a rally cross series, but, um, um, this idea of wanting to race has always kept me going and, and it's a drug and it's, you know, every, every few months we have to fill it. Um, yeah, uh, I, I was, I was brought into GoPro and that really helped shape, um, shape who I am today. So I learned the media business by helping build the media team. There were seven of us on the media team. When I started, it was in a townhouse in Half Moon Bay, California, <laughs> like saw Nick Woodman every single day, interface with him every single day and watched him turn into a billionaire and all my friends there turn into, you know retired millionaires and i missed that boat by a few months um just by you know having the nature of when i signed my my permanent contract there mm. but i quit my job on the runway of the san jose airport nick flew me in his g6 to go off-road truck racing and with a bunch of billionaires and the whole time i knew i had already committed to start 
than my own company because I knew that in order for me to tr be on the level that I wanted to be, I had to do it on my own terms. So, um, yeah, I um, I quit GoPro on the San, San Jose Airport runway, um, getting off a of G6 after having like the most epic meal into the sunset, drinking beers with some of my, you know, best friends and, and heroes at the mo at the time you know um really that's a looked tough up decision to, to make then it was tough i was very nervous i was like yeah. the guy at dinner that's like <laughs> <"Che> cheers <laughs> like well, i knew i was gonna do it and he gave me a hug and said uh everybody i, I like awkwardly like waited till it was just me and him you know like everybody's saying bye his porsche gt2 is idling on the san jose runway and his the, the jet engines are spooling and I'm just like, I'm literally like, I've never been so nervous in my life. I respect this guy. He gave me so many opportunities and I, I got, I saw the world through GoPro and that opportunity, but I, I also had a lot of resent because I quote unquote hung up my, my boots for that. And like, um, I knew I needed, I needed to be an entrepreneur and I couldn't work for somebody else. I missed the boat. I watched all, all these people become millionaires and I didn't get that opportunity. I, I did, it did work out for me in a good way, a lot of other good ways. But I still, I had a, I had a man up and tell him face to face that, Hey man, like, but it was this moment where he gave me a hug and he's like, fuck, we made it. He said, we made it to me. And oh, I was like, Oh, and you're like, Actually. I was like, bro, you made it. And I was like, and no offense, I'm so grateful for this opportunity. And I gave him a big hug and we sat and talked for a few hours. Actually, he, he, and he picked my brain as to my intentions of leaving. And it was a pivotal mo moment in GoPro because, um, at the time, there, there was a lot of employees, and everybody had been brought in for uh, bringing the co company public, and it had just gone public. Stocks were soaring, and then I could feel internally that it was, it was you know, and I think a lot of companies that are new to going public, you it's know, have their down, downfalls. Yeah, yeah, there's a down, that's just part of the nature of business nowadays, and it's, it's a little bit sad because there's a lot of greed in that. Um, I saw the writing on the wall and pulled the plug, and I think I was one of the first original employees to leave, and it was bad a bad look internally and so the next day they offered me double the salary double my stock then i still already committed to starting donut which was a media company that we started to um to to answer kids don't care about cars so we started making digital content that yeah. was aimed at millennial audience um yeah and i said peace to gopro what do you i mean i think there's probably never a great time to to quit something like that but what i mean if you knew then that you wanted to go after that that the best moment ever you know, and you drop down out of the sky and, and, and you know, touch down. If you know you're ready to go at that point, then then you're ready to go. You're ready like, to go. There's no looking back. Yeah. Yeah, that's so. it. I felt like I felt uh, there was on it. Honestly, that day it felt you have to listen to it, I guess, because there, there was in, in that moment of what should be such an amazing moment, such an amazing time of life. I felt um, I felt like I'm never going to be these guys. Right. I felt like the biggest odd. I felt like I was on my island by myself as much as the opportunity was great. I had to I had to to leave the island and start, start my own. That's gotta be strange. I mean, to know that you were literally days away from being a lot of those guys, but just could never break through that little glass barrier. Yeah, it was interesting. It turned out to be the right call. I mean, the, the, the um, I mean, and for a lot of ways, and I think it was a tough decision, but, um, you know, I watched the company, unfortunately struggle for the last, you know, six years. Well, we've started a few media companies that have done really well. Um, we still, kill ourselves every day to, to keep the lights on. But, um, we're very grateful. We have amazing clients. We work with some of the best brands in the industry and it's all in nature of, because we all wanted to go racing and we just needed to keep doing what we we're doing to make it go, make right. it happen. So let's talk racing for one last second. What, uh, if you could go just to be dropped off in any situation for racing and money wasn't the, you know, the, the answer, what do you race? Uh, I mean, I never envisioned it for myself because I I understood the uh, the challenges of becoming a Formula One driver. I guess when I was really young, I, I I wanted I wanted that for myself. But it's it's a it's a it's a family's lifelong commitment to make a Formula One driver a Formula One driver, and that's the ultimate. That's the pinnacle of the sport. That's the pinnacle of business. That's the pinnacle of sport in general. I mean, it's a multi. It's a billion dollar a year for two car effort. I mean, that's Jeez. Ferrari. That's Mercedes. That's that's thousands of people working towards two cars. I mean, that's it's the it's the biggest sport in the world that's not liked in America or yeah. not really not known in America, which is ironic. But it's definitely the pinnacle of of modern sport as far as commercialism and all that goes, and and yeah. viewership on one single sporting event every weekend. Um, you know, it surpasses soccer because there's soccer spread over you know hundreds of teams, whereas Formula One's twenty two guys. Twenty two guys. Twenty two guys. For the layperson, that's exclusive. Yeah. <laughs> For the layperson, what is the difference between probably NASCAR, what we Americans mm -hmm. understand as as 
racing. Yeah. Brother. Uh, and, and you know what you're talking about. Well, so the, the common misconception is that NASCAR is, um, easy and that it's, it's like a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's kind of like the, the dumpster of a lot of Americans see it as like this, like, you know, how boring you just go around circles. So NASCAR is, is commonly known as the most difficult. I mean, I think most formula one guys would admit that NASCAR is the most difficult. Nobody's ever penetrated the NASCAR world and try and, and with success outside of NASCAR. No, ever. Those like cars the, aren't really designed to do anything clever. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're the most clever in that rule set, but the rule set is very restrictive. So they're like 3000 pound shit boxes. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then you have to figure out how to angle the rear wheels just right and lay the weight just right and risk your life every you know 12 seconds at you know at the limit at 170 miles an hour plus it's very very challenging um and it, those guys grew up doing that and that's why they're good at it so nascar is like the the, the known as like the the most challenging kind of racing and formula one um is challenging in a whole another letter let, set of um reasons and it's a lot of um business pressure because your family spends millions of dollars to get you there unless you're like one of very few people that actually came up through like like it doesn't really happen that way anymore so you you've you got all this money on the line you've got um you've you've got there's only 22 of you so you're like a franchise representing you know anywhere from 400 to 1000 employees or more and back at the shop um, and you know, like I said, a billion dollars. So it's, it's 10 times easily, 10 times more. I mean, the best NASCAR teams operate on $40 million budgets. The, the worst formula one teams operate on like $400 million budgets. So, wow. um, it's financially, it's a whole nother ball game. Um, and the drive from a driving standpoint, it's just precision. You can't be, you have to be hundred percent perfect every lap. I mean, you can't really make mistakes and it comes down to tenths. So you're like, you really like it's your, 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 you have to be robotic. And if you're not, then you won't cut it. I mean, even no matter, no matter how much money you bring to the table, if you, if you, uh, everybody in formula one's good, um, there's some people that are less good than others, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a whole nother world of, of precision. Wow. Yeah, I think I'd have to dive into the rally. I really want to try rally. Dude, rally just seems Rally's like so much fun. So cool. Yeah, scary as shit. But I'm I watched sure. one of the Jim Connor movies last night again for the eight billionth time, and I was just like, God, I would just to sit in the cockpit of one of those cars, I would just pee myself. It's it's wild. It's a whole other level of danger. Yeah, I don't mm -hmm. really have the rally. I mean, it's fun. I I've done a, a few days in a rally car, and it's like ear to ear grinning fun. The most fun I've ever had is what I did this year, which was rally cross, which is, it's like the crack cocaine or, um, yeah, probably the crack cocaine or methamphetamine of, <laughs> of racing. If we talk about <laughs> racing being a drug, <laughs> <laughs> um, or a whip it, right. Well, I don't ever done a whip it, but I think that's like a short, real hot, real high hang. You don't really know what happened, but you get done with it and you're like, what just happened? Let's do it again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So maybe it's the whip it or racing okay. because it's like uh four to six, sometimes eight laps max of just the most intense wheel to wheel jumping car action you could ever imagine. The, the rally cars varying out, varying, um, grip. So you have, um, dirt and asphalt. And, um, it's, 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 an, it's over in the blink of an eye. If you don't get the first cor cor corner perfect, uh, then you're not going to win the race. So it's, it's crazy. It's all about the start in the first corner and then just not making a mistake. And it's like four laps and you're like, what the hell did I just do? Like that you're, you're panting, you're drenched in sweat. I mean, you literally give yourself completely to that four laps and it's the longest, like, in, I mean, unless you're having the perfect, yeah, it's the longest race ever, no matter how good your car is. If your car is good, you're in the front thinking, God, when's this race going to end? If your car is bad, you're in the back, at, crashed out, sweating, thinking, God, how many laps is this race? It's taking forever. <laughs> uh, it's, it's hard. Uh, it's really fun, though. Really fun. When I asked that question, I was really hoping that we would get to rally at some point because because that seems to me like just the... I thought it was cool when it became X Games. Yeah. That was really neat. That was like when Pastrana was getting into the scene, I think, right? Yeah. No, he was in the scene before at that. Yeah, he had practiced. Because North Carolina, he was there. That was North Carolina. He was there. Kim was he, there. Tanner was still racing the Volkswagen Polo at that point, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those guys had been like touched. Touch, I think they say with age comes cage. It's just like with all the motocross guys, all the FMX guys, um, freestyle motocross guys. Um, you know, as they, they realize they can only break their femur so many times, right? <laughs> the, you know, or shatter their pelvis so many times, they all, uh, started driving race cars, uh, a lot of them. And so, yeah, I raced Bilko FMX, the last, the last event. 
that was really fun. Um, the last event I raced in, um, but they the those guys brought rallycross. Rallycross as a sport was re- is really popular in Europe, not so much in America. But F- X Games put it on the map for sure. And then to reference your Jim Connors part, you worked on all the four, five, four, six, yeah. seven, eight. Did, yeah, did, and then nine. I because uh, nine I worked was, on a lot of them. I don't know how exactly think, which ones. Which one is uh? It was the one through what, Saudi Arabia or we, Dubai. 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 That was pretty yeah. epic. I watched that. That's the one I watched last night, and yeah. somehow I hadn't seen it yet. And yeah, it's just silly. Yeah. So. Yeah. Is it incredible? Like what a what an experience! You like, were there for that? Yeah, we yeah. both were. Yeah, really? I rode in that helicopter. That's, yep. That was I think. the one at the very end. Yeah, get the fuck out of here! Oh, except for <laughs> I was supposed to go in the helicopter when he jumped out, but they threw me out and put somebody else in. But I did go from the from the the hilly landing pad to the end of the runway, and so that was my first time ever in a helicopter, and I thought Pretty it was just experience. the coolest thing. At, so yeah. jealous. Meanwhile, All right. So meanwhile, so, I was in the plane getting air sick. I mean, we did like fucking thirty r- r- laps in that thing. It's a skydiving plane, skydive Dubai, yellow plane. And I'm like, oh, God dang, one more, fl- one more loop, and I got really sick. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, I I apologize. I'm to interview Nate now. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is Nate's panic face, by yeah, the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The real question is, is how white am I really right now? So, I'm like, yeah. oh god, this is. Uh, I have no feeling in my fingers anymore. Camera four over there is capturing Nate at his most uncomfortable. Uh, so I was thinking of this as I watched this last night, and and Ken does the backflip off the helicopter into the water. Um, one shot at that, right? Yeah, did that and, one shot because I mean yeah. it was dry, obviously. So one shot, he does the flip. You got to flip off of a helicopter into the water, and he sticks the landing. Which I'm guessing is not his area of expertise. Well, he actually does a lot of that. Like uh, he lives in Salt Lake City, Utah, and they always go out because he gets sponsored by the the big Maverick Boat Company. So he always mm-hmm. it's he always a shot of him doing a backflip off he the is very, cliffs. He's a very apt athlete. He can yeah. he can uh, you know he started DC Shoes and was around some of the best skaters and, and snowboarders in the world for his whole career. He's he's also very talented. I think he was raised on dirt bikes dirt and bikes, then yeah. went into He's a very talented dude, and and was a big inspiration into all of this world because oh I, I bet mean, he, mm-hmm. he he took the BMW film thing to the next level with branded content and Jim Connor series, which is the number one uh, branded content series of all time, uh, in, over year and year uh, over, um, pretty pretty successful, um, and he runs his career off of that one film every every year. The so I watched the basically the making of ten the series that they put out on. Which Amazon. Was Amazon last oh, yeah. year, um, which was just wild. I mean, for somebody who's not in that world to watch, you know, snippets of that just blew me away. Yeah, I mean, you should watch the uh, plus that truck. Fuck. Yeah, you should watch the, the truck. Is that GoPro better. behind the scenes one. I think that one's better. Yeah, we yeah. did a pretty cool one of LA. Uh, Nate might be a little biased on that, but uh, I think uh, that's like the first LA? one I saw. Oh, is with that the, the Mustang? That about? was the Mustang one. Yeah, with the yeah, the I the love scenes. that. That oh, I'm so mad they. I'm just mad they what they did to the Mustang. I, sh- I wish they would have kept it naturally oh, okay. aspirated yeah. and just made another one. Yeah, I, that thing was so sexy. It was good. all blacked out and the truck and the car are are amazing. The Mustang and the and the F100. I mean, it's two one two of my favorite cars ever. But then just to watch them at that pinnacle mm-hmm. and and getting to roll into Ford and just be like, hey, can you make me a whatever? Yeah. A, a, a Ford of this era. Unlock some budgie for me. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Just like, yeah. They, they 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 do a really good job, and um, we we like I was so like I mean he uh, he I'll say it over and over. He was so instrumental to our careers in this space. You know, we like working with him at an early age was I mean to to watch him like just do what he does and because he loves it and just wants to do it on his own terms. Like when I, I realized that there was a point in my life, I was living in North Carolina and I was watching all these NASCAR drivers come in and out of, of um, the shop and agency that I was working with. It was a, uh, my business partner now that I started race service with Jacob um, and donut. Um, he, his dad represented NASCAR drivers and before that represented like he's old school American, you know, racing history. Like they, they, 
they launched Evil Knievel's career, pun intended. Uh, they like they 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 you know his grandpa was put on the wild wide world of sports ABC specials that did launch that brought Evil mainstream and and they owned a racetrack in Southern California and won Indy, Indy 500s. Um, and then his dad took that to the next level and and managed NASCAR drivers. So I I went to them asking for help when I went out there because I just knew that there was one place for, for it, but. Fast forward now, uh, a decade later, looking back at that, we realize now like his grandpa was like making viral videos before videos were videos, and 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 then uh, we we ultimately started Donut, and 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 we're kind of the next iteration of that. A few generations later, make you know doing weird shit in cars based on the stuff that we were doing with Ken in the Jim Connor series, and and really like we started making shareable automotive content to to um um to because all the car companies you know it's a fifty six billion dollar a year advertising industry second to pharmaceuticals um it's and that was a few years that's an old stat it's a drug of a different kind right and it's uh they but for the longest time the industry became super stagnant with just terrible marketing where they were just running running uh you know running footage of the cars for their commercials like and giving like you know apr low apr like you wonder why kids don't care about cars anymore because you're not speaking to them to right first of all they're not watching the tv that you think they're watching they're doing it online and you're not, you're not, so even to this day, we fight that with digital content budgets being shit on time and time again, and us getting the scraps and us making the videos that really actually, um, inspire people, kids to like cars and, and, um, and be brand loyal. Um, but yeah, Ken was a major part of that. And, uh, um, I forget why we went there, but, um, yeah, it was, it was, you just summed up our entire podcast. And we live in a funny world where we all pretend like we have it all figured out. And so we've like put ourselves in categories and we, we like kind of like, you know, I think that's the biggest f- fault in the world is pretending like you have to have this figured out. So as long as you keep, remain like, um, I guess open mind is a bad term because I think when you're op- when you think you're open minded, you're actually closed minded, in my opinion. But I think uh, just being a good person and just being willing to like, yeah, I don't know. I think it's, it's, it's a special. I mean, imagine what you guys are doing now is really cool to meet, meet so many different walks of life. It was I think for all of us, I mean, because we're kind of all in the same boat. Um, totally career wise where it's just yeah. like literally the what the fuck am I doing yeah. and yeah. Is, is this an intervention have I not because what yeah, the fuck am I doing is something I ask my, myself every morning <laughs> like what the fuck and uh, you guys is this an intervention am I this is wrong? this is how this goes we say uh, what the fuck are you doing and if the answer is having a fucking good time yeah. then continue on yeah so yeah, that's true. This is one of those like you know those diagrams where if like if yes go this way yeah if you're having a fucking good time if yes, go this way. Yeah. I, keep on down the trail. I can relate. That's what we, our business now is, is like, it's almost sometimes too good to be true. It's also really, you know, like any business can be really stressful. We have a big overhead and a lot of employees now, and um, we make automotive content for a living, but we don't really know what that is anymore because it's like the digi- the world doesn't really know what content is worth anymore. And like budgets are terrible for digital content still, even though they're like the driving force for most brand decisions. And and like influencer marketing is at a like you know a peak, and we need to figure out a better name for that because the fuck is influencer marketing? But brands know that they can't talk about themselves anymore, so inevitably our value proposition is that much bigger, and we still are like, what the fuck are we doing? Um, how are we gonna pay our bills? You know, but uh, it it's, keeps working out, and and uh, we're gonna keep um, on the same path as long as we're having fun. And the second it turns not fun, is hey, it's not worth it. <laughs> like it's just not like anything in life right like sure. it's too short to that entirely it's too short That's yeah like the last job i quit <laughs> yeah it was just yeah not having fun anymore so i'm out see ya yeah yeah man i mean it and i don't think it really matters what your level of pay is it's not about that no. it, you know really is where's my level of happiness yeah and and dude i mean you know i i got a, a chance to speak to a, a group of young entrepreneurs one time and and you know, someone referenced the like, well, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. You're like, no, man, if you work, you know, if you love what you do, you'll gladly kill yourself to you'll to work continue every doing it. second of your life. Yeah. And yeah. it's to a fault. <laughs> like, yeah, you and know, you wake up texting, you go to sleep texting. Uh, it's just crazy. It's like, right. Mm-hmm. And yeah. a blast doing it. Yeah. Every morning it's just like, all right, yeah. let's just keep drinking from the it fire is. hose. It's getting it's crazy now because we do live in a world where it's like everything, everybody's accessible all the time. So I've like my challenge lately has been like really knowing I like not when to turn off because that's not really, but like you just have to like make your own time for yourself as well because it's like 
you know, we've been doing this kind of iteration of the, of what, what we, of racing cars and wanting to race cars and working, you know, in automotive marketing for over a decade. And, you know, now with these cell phone computers, they say like, don't want to be strapped to a desk. Well, we strap our desks to our hands now yeah. and we have arthritis because of it. So like, like, you know, you have to find your, your balance in there as well. And, um, I've been lucky enough to kind of find some balance and, um, you know, travel a little bit outside of work, but also work is so fun that it kind of becomes all blurry and is all part of work and right. everything I do is kind of working. So how do you, um, how do you put, I mean, how do you combat the idea that, and obviously I'm looking at this from a much lower level than professional, mm -hmm. but I think, I feel like anybody might feel like they could get into the content creation space at this point, because it doesn't take much to buy a GoPro. We've all got the internet. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you, how do you differentiate yourself? I mean, you guys have obviously done such an amazing job of, of having people come to you because they know you're doing a great thing. Um, you know, do you combat that at all? Is that well, a, is that a I mean, well, not even, sorry, but not, you don't even really need the GoPro or anything. You have it all sitting right there on your lap. Right. They have the editing software on Apple's the, new yeah. Apple 11 commercial where they're like, this yeah. whole thing was filmed on an, on a phone. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the quality of that, the, well, that was always kind of the thing with I, iPhone versus GoPro. Nick used to always say, we're, ne we're never going to try to battle the iPhone because the iPhone will always be there for like your quick moment right there. But eh, you know, and it is, you won't really strap your iPhone to your head. But um, to be honest, I don't, I mean, I don't use my GoPro as much as I should anymore. Um, and I do shoot a lot with my, I don't, I don't personally, cr I create a lot of like still imagery, I guess, just on the fly, but I don't necessarily shoot video myself anymore. Um, but I will say that like the, the most powerful tool is my, uh, sorry, GoPro, but my iPhone in my pocket with the new wide angle lens. And then, then I use the GoPro app because the GoPro quick app is dope. And it's like, it's made to be user friendly. That was the whole thing is like with GoPro, you could, you could, um, you, you could make the best hardware in the world, but, and people would be super inspired. That was our job was to inspire the world. And it was the raddest job ever. Like right. go on trips and, that, and inspire the world. And it was so, and it would come, came from a really pure place. And so, um, and it created the self-fulfilling prophecy where you inspire the world and ultimately there, everybody be, became advocates for us. And it was just this circle of brand advocate and, um, they would make content, they put it out, they tag GoPro, we, we'd regurgitate the good stuff and <laughs> it would just like, you know, it was this like this beautiful thing. But, um, you, you know, at the end of it, you look back and you're like, or at one point we stopped and said 99.999% of the content shot on here never sees the light of day because nobody knows how to edit. It's difficult to get that content onto whatever device. And you don't know what, there's a lot of technical mumbo jumbo and shit in there that you don't have to figure out. But we, um, w yeah, GoPro spent a lot of money and time, um, on a, on developing their app to have like automatic editing and uh, like really plug and play interface and it's 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 now I, I don't even think it's branded gopro anymore i think it's called quick and um it's um it's it's you can import iphone clips into it and it, like we'll make edits for you just by importing clips that was a big game changer for like uh summer like we'd go uh go and like jump off rocks and go swimming and stuff like that and somebody would have a gopro and uh he'd be like oh dude check out this jump that you just did and then he pulled out his phone and then i get to watch the video like right there yeah and i was like what like yeah Unreal. That and was it's so cool. It's just like making it actual easy because being before that it was not easy. You know, no, it's, like, no, it's no, literally yeah. the only editing I've ever done in my life that I've successfully made it through to a com like complete thing mm -hmm. was a a trip to Kauai where my sons had a, a GoPro, but we were able to get it back and forth on the phones and edit it with quick. And mm -hmm. I'm like, oh shoot, that took whatever five that minutes while I was laying on the couch, you yeah. know, in the room. I never really integrated the phone and the the uh the gopro together the only the like the one time that i did i strapped a, a gopro to a crab pot and threw it in and i, I monitored the crabs coming in no through the oh, phone it's that shit creepy. for hours yeah, it's, it's creepy so funny. Crab pot videos like, are oh, stupid excited <laughs> yeah it was funny because <laughs> they just like <laughs> they just show up you know, out of nowhere yeah, footage yeah. has that weird sound yeah. like it's so loud but so quiet at the yeah. same time <laughs> <laughs> Just, oh, that is they're good. just gnawing at the fish and whatever. And oh, I mean, good. I mean, it was grainy as shit and ugly, and but it was still cool. I'll bring some ideas. I don't know. Um, I'm guessing Ken Block and his crew have spent some money on what they do, but I would just as happily watch crab pot videos <laughs> 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 and and be equally stoked at both oh, of them. That was like, the worst too. Like I remember at GoPro, we'd have like this. We had two departments. One was brand content and one was UGC brand content. We'd go make the videos, the launch videos and all the shit that 
um, you know, Nate and I worked together heavily on all that stuff, but, um, um, you, so you'd have the brand content and you have to UGC, which UGC was user generated footage, um, user generated content. And it would, and it would be just, we just get tons and tons of hard drives and clips. And I think we had people that would be out reaching out to people that had like viral videos happening. It'd always be like the most, like a kid, like walking for the first time that they spent literally it was a real life moment which is actually obviously incredible tons of but we'd, we'd be spending like millions of dollars on all this stuff and all the ugc stuff would be like doing better and we'd just be like god damn it like oh <laughs> <laughs> but it was really what made the business so successful was getting users exp- inspired i think well because if an average everyday idiot like me can make something that that's bitching then i think your company has done exactly what they were set out to do that's it um, and it started right there at the Volkswagen Jetta TDI Cup. Yeah, right. Nick Woodman. That was really the change, though. Uh, honestly, and he'll say it in all of his interviews was when he took the camera from being a surf camera, got it off the surfboard and into other environments of life. That's when it. That's when the company took a transition mm-hmm. into being like mainstream kind of uh, in-home product. How much would he be screwed if if you guys all hadn't crashed? Right then. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to say that was the. I'm going to go ahead and say that he owes me for the crash damages from that race. Still Absolutely. to this day. Yeah. Sixteen grand of crash damages. <laughs> Holy oh, shit! Geez. So yeah. on the whole GoPro conversation, I was actually curious. You've done a lot of really cool projects with GoPro, and which one is your you most proud of? Because I can think of. Oh. A couple of that you've done that. Don't feel like you need to say the ones that Nate was yeah, involved. Just well, actually, Nate the one that I'm thinking <laughs> of is not, I wasn't there What were there you thinking for. of? I'm thinking of your India, India trip. trip. India yeah. was cool. It was cool. It was, I watched, Nate sent us that. That was, first off, that bike you were on. Yeah, it was fun. Not bad. Yeah, it was fun. It God, was weird. Amazing. It was difficult for the environment because it was like off-roading on a street bike. But it was, um, yeah, we took a, I think a couple week or nine day or something trip to the middle of nowhere. No, it was a couple weeks. Um, where we got lost in the Himalayas and went to the highest road in the world. Um, but at one point we were like four days away from civilization and they're like, okay. And at the, like the highest altitude you could get a car and they were like, okay, if you, um, if you get altitude sickness, so don't, don't get altitude sickness. Cause if you do, it's four days back in a station wagon and you're like, <laughs> so just don't, just be don't thanks. cause helicopters <laughs> can't get up here. And you're like, okay, uh, Oh, Oh, so how do I not? Oh, well you, you just don't. I mean, like, so I remember <laughs> like laying sense. in bed at night. Um, I got, we got back. It was like 90 degrees, like hot day up for how high we were. And like d- difficult day of riding. You wouldn't get very far because it's like these terrible roads. And every once in a while you come across a group of people trying to make the road out of like hammers. Sure. And yeah, you're, there's no roads really. And, and then we get to this base camp and it's, you feel like you're in a Mount Everest documentary and except you have a motorcycle next to you. And <laughs> Uh, it's middle of summertime, so it's like 90 something degrees. And one of my friends, Zach, was like, Oh, we're gonna go film the, the other dude, um, over in the you know, by the cliff that we passed earlier. So, well, and I was like, I need to chill, like, I'm burnt. I like this was a long day, and I was getting altitude sickness, I could feel <laughs> like I was just really tired unexplainably. And uh, and so I was like, I'm just gonna lay down here for a little bit. Next thing I know, I'll wake up like not being able to breathe, and it's pitch black in below freezing. Like it oh, just like flips. Like the second the sun drops, you're done. And and I couldn't. It's so dark that you can't see anything. No flashlights. No nothing. I'm sitting there with like no idea where I'm at. Barely able to breathe. Find my I, like yell. Find my way back to a base camp, and then like get into the tent. And they're like, give me some tea, and I chill out for a little bit. And I'm like, okay. So my breathing isn't working while I sleep. Yeah, that was what, what was happening. So that night I went to bed and, my, uh, you know, apparently I, you know, uh, can't, I, you know, I've always snored when I sleep and it gets really bad when I'm in the high elevations, apparently, because I would wake up not being able to get air all night long. And it'd be like, where am I? Okay. Okay. We're going to no altitude sickness. So, and then like, and it was like every night like that for another three nights. It was pretty intense, but it was incredible, incredible, intense, uh, incredible trip. And yeah, so we went to the highest road in the world for GoPro and it was a part of one of our launch videos. I can't remember which one. But. And that was the first time an actual GoPro employee was in the launch video. I think so. Yeah, well, you no, pay, I think you paved the way for that. Did I? Mm-hmm. That's how it was explained to me. Well, mm-hmm. probably, so, probably was the case. That's what I heard. I mean, yeah, it, you know, yeah I guess that's the case. It must be. I think, I think it was frowned and, upon until then. And now the team is really, really small at GoPro and the media team. We went from like multiple hundreds of people. And now the only people still working there are pretty much my, our original team, like are still the core people on, on the media side. So I think we did something right. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was fun. What a, what an way. experience. Can we link that? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. We should, people should watch that video because it's really cool. cool. I think, yeah. Um, well, easy. About, yeah, it was a fun time of life. I was about to have my little daughter and um, it was it ended up being kind of a story of my life a little bit. Um, yeah, it was fun. I, I We shot it and, and then it spent, you know, I don't know how many terabytes of footage. We, we brought probably like 50 cameras and wasted them day in and day out. And and then, you know, it was my job to, you know, uh, they, they wanted to make the team leads and everybody everybody had to um you know our th- our philosophy was everybody had to edit and be a part of every process part of the process and so like my uh at the time my nemesis at the company was like this total opposite of me i'm like the young know, go-getter like just like walk in stupid i'm gonna kill this with my energy and um yeah make this company my bitch he was like the chill hippie like uh, awesome dude uh, but at the time i <laughs> we we argued a lot and he was like, you're editing this. So I spent weeks editing that damn thing. <laughs> and it was, of course, all the way up until a deadline, ed- exporting until, you know, six in the morning the next day and finally got it up at the last second for because th- th- that was our launch video for for um, per one of the cameras, um, which were the company's life of blood was these videos. So mm-hmm. it was challenging, but it was a really fun time of life. Where'd you guys get those bikes? Uh, there's, um, I, they were brand new. Royal Enfield, um, is a bike manufacturer and I think they were going to give them to us to, to use, and then we were to give them back. But, um, something happened with the, um, timeline and we ended up paying a, uh, a guy who has like a, um, a tour company, um, to, uh, to buy them in for us. And so it was, one of them ended up at the GoPro office actually. So we, we have, we, we kept it. Royal just makes the most gorgeous bikes. I mean, yeah, they do. I've never, I've never rode one. I've never, but I, I love looking at them. They're cool. And they you have like, the leather jacket for it. I have the leather jacket for it. That's yeah, the absolutely. first part of yeah. being a good rider. <laughs> it's it's uh, the right leather I'm jacket. Still a man out. <sighs> That's fine. I'll work on it. <laughs> on that. Bike. Yeah. <laughs> I guess like how I have the dog just sitting here. I d- didn't even really think about that. It's just, just natural. How you doing, Slade? This is the Adventures of Floyd. He's, right. Um, I was saying earlier, he's traveled the world more than more than all of us, and. uh He's exhausted. Yeah, he's he's exhausted. <laughs> we he should have just had a camera him. on Floyd the whole time. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And then made Nate edit footage of your just your crotch the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time you yeah, edited a GoPro video. Really need to get two hours of this, but <laughs> well, all right. that was one of the best parts about GoPro videos is how much embarrassing content you get from people that didn't realize their cameras were still rolling. Because like we'd work with oh, like yeah. the biggest athletes in the world with cameras on their heads while they go pee in the bushes. Ken Block picking his nose. Sean White. Do you remember that? Sean White with the upset stomach and like train for the Olympics. We'll just uh, we'll just say that he he purposefully gave us some really good shots of him relieving himself. Oh my gosh! Yeah, he's a character. But yeah, that was the, that was the best part about GoPro is the, the great people that we got to interface with, like and and work next to and meet. And we, we had, like we had these athlete summits where the all the GoPro athletes from all over the world would come to one place and we teach them how to better use their cameras and just hang out with them and inspire them. And it was like one second I'm like surfing a party wave with like Sean White and Sheckler and Kelly Slater comes flying by with like oh, just like the best athletes in the world doing just having fun. And that was like that's what really led to the spirit, I guess, of race service and all, all, all the way that, you know, we live our lives and is just have fun. Keep doing what you love. And, and uh, yeah, that just kind of works out. One of the things that I thought was really cool about Nate before I really got to meet Nate, um, which I went to high school with his wife and so that's how i even know nate at all Mm. but i uh i saw some videos on facebook and he was like hooking cameras up to uh pastrana's car yeah and i was just like what that's so cool dude and it's like yeah really like i can't imagine all the different faces and people that you meet and stuff well i think when you when you run into people like that so frequently that you just realize so quickly how how normal most i mean they're just people right Yeah. yeah Um, normal if not extremely inspirational yeah yeah <laughs> i mean know, the guy doing, stole the shirt from it. very normal yeah very chill very zen human being he just rips people's heads off for a living that <laughs> I, th- I think i think the thing with like oh you're having this conversation recently the thing with like superstar people or like we're talking about burning man i did burning man in a really extreme funny way this year and to see people like think about Burning Man is everybody is equal. Like it's a weird, like love it or hate it. Like you, you have an idea of what it is. It's the most spiritual, amazing. It's if it's for you, it's for you and you'll know when it is in that kind of way. 
the but we did it in like the thing there is everybody's like lowered to to like not lowered but everybody's the same level you're raised to the same level let's put it that way and mm-hmm. so there, it's like an alternate universe where the bullshit that we think is right about life is is exposed and you're just doing what you want to do Every, like you're just in a new world for you know whatever nine days and i think with like having analyzed that situation and like seeing people as equals and and uh, really like we're all just humans pretending to have it figured out and i think what makes people that are like you know travis pastrana for instance is a great example of this like uh, you know uh, makes people that way is because they've 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 been filled with enough confidence sometimes a little too much confidence to be like what they to be an open book and to be like powerful and to not second guess their decisions and to just kind of do what they feel is right and to kind of flow a little harder than a lot of people and and Yes, I think what makes those those amazing people like you know Travis Pastrana is Travis Pastrana because he is he he was told he was the best at something from the beginning of his like Troy Polamalu same thing like you, you're the best linebacker in the in the game until he since he was a little kid and every day that somebody tells you that you're enforced as the best yeah and so it's you know when you're when you're filled with that much confidence in who you are and what you're doing it's so easy to kind of just to just to live in a flow state that kind of um, works for you and not let people kind of push you around and be able to like kind of take the the upper hand and and not the upper hand because it's not about that but it's um it, i think it lowers lowers uh this thing that we all kind of we caught ourselves with like the day-to-day bullshit so quickly so often and we all do it and troy palomalo and travis ajana cloud, cloud their minds with their day-to-day struggles for sure but you know i think when you're when you're um when you're confident and um and ha- and and confidence i guess comes from doing what you sh- what you like following your heart and doing what you love and i think that's that's when you become um you know powerful like like and powerful in the sense that you live a happy full life and inspire people mm-hmm. the most successful people i know are are so singularly focused on what's important mm-hmm. to them um and they really just don't allow barriers to be an object mm-hmm. you know i mean it's just you just you just moving along, yeah. right? If there's something there, you're just gonna yeah, it's there, and I'm gonna hurdle it, and, and yeah. off we go because because I can. Yeah. I think that I think that we should maybe what we should all do is is figure out a way to set up a parenting class for for people that are associated with the most successful people in the world, right? Not the most successful people because nobody really wants to hear from them. No. But the ones that are peripheral. Yeah. And so they can come in and just be like, no, nah, this is you're like yeah. this person has never been really convinced that they can't do something. Yeah. If you could somehow convey that to your kids, yeah. then shit, they'd be, they'd be all over it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. That's not an object. That's just a, it's just the next step. Yeah. I think at some point you like for me, I learned at some point in my life, well, you definitely like I've, I have, you know, I could go on about like tragedy and, and setbacks and shit, but like I, well, I, Bernie man taught me two things. Well, I, and it won't make sense. I guess if I say it just, blank but it's everything's perfect and nothing matters um which i think is a lot of that like uh that mentality like everything perfect not being that it's like actually perfect like we think perfect is but perfect in the sense that like the universe is balanced and you're gonna have you're gonna have setbacks and that but at the end of the day those setbacks are perfectly balanced with some other positive thing in your life and really i would challenge anybody to kind of to to challenge that like the universe is balanced like whatever you believe in balance happens like you get in what you put out like that kind of mentality or you get out what you put in. Um, and, uh, it's kind of something that, that, uh, uh you know, I think so-called setbacks, um, um, teach you. And, um, I think a long time ago in my life, I, I realized that, um, everything really works out like regardless of how bummed out you are or whatever, like, trust me, I have plenty of dark days and, and challenges in my life still, but, you know, I mean, you just step back and say it, you, it does work out if you just do it. Like, just like don't get caught up in the bullshit and just realize that this is all kind of a game. And like, yeah, like it's 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 a made up set of rules that we all um, live by. And um, I think treating people right and following your heart and living with good intentions is kind of gets you where you want to go. You know, and I guess easier said than done. But um, but yeah, it's a fun, fun, powerful place to be in to be like in that flow state and. And really, just kind of going with the flow for better or for worse. Trust me, it pisses off plenty of people in my life. Um, but but I think that's 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 a fun way to, for me. That's where I found my 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 uh, satisfaction. And Absolutely. Going back to many years ago, I th- uh, I can't remember if you had this in your dining room in North Carolina, or I know it was in your YouTube video back when you were mm. trying to do the blogging to get yep. into the racing or whatever. But fail harder. 
Fail and that's always you. stuck with me. And it's funny to me because now like people preach that like every single day, like Gary Vee is all about it. Just fail, fail yeah. mm-hmm. and then I, learn from your fail, so failures. People, and then you, and then you win. Yeah. Cause you, you're learning. You learn so little from, from winning. Yeah. You know I mean? If yeah. you coach anything forever, it's just like, oh, okay, well, you're going to keep winning and you can fail along with that and not learn anything. But as soon as you actually lose, at whatever it is you're doing, then you've got to take a step back and analyze. And I think the power comes from when you realize that that failure was actually a win. Yeah. That's when you've like hit that real like flow state stride. Like, like, you know, at the time it might hurt, but you know, at the end of the day, like if, if you can, if you can grow from, from your experiences then then you're, you're better off, you know? And I, I, I teach my daughter. I try to teach my daughter. It's hard sometimes. Cause I'm like, I must sound like a kook to her sometimes, like fully just some of the things that I teach her, but like, like I, t- I teach her that every day is better than the previous day and that like if you grow from your experiences and 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 really are living a full life in the right path then you do like you really like look at life like that don't don't there's never looking back on anything you're right now be current be present and realize that your days are are, are a com- compilation of of the previous and that each one will continually get better as long as you're growing in the right direction and it's a pretty simple thing but i don't think we remind ourselves that, that enough um and yeah, it's fun to watch my little daughter try to figure out what the fuck I'm talking about. But there's maybe a, she'll go to Burning Man one day. <laughs> there's, there's a guy named Jack Harbaugh that that his he's got two sons. One is the football coach for Michigan University of Michigan. The other one's a football coach for the Baltimore Ravens. And um, apparently, when he dropped his his kids off for school every day, that was his thing. He was a football coach, but he you know he made sure that he he dropped his kids off for school. That was his his big moment with them. And Every day when they got out of the car, he would say, who's got it better than us? And it didn't matter. His kids still talk about that. I've heard them both because they're both kind of, you know, coaches or inspirational mm-hmm. speakers or whatever. And, and they all reference that. Like, you know, it didn't matter if, you know, we'd have this career altering loss or, or, you know, a death in the family or whatever. Like every day at school, he was going to drop us off and say, who's got it better than us? And they, and they were like, it shaped our entire existence that, you know, it is good. Mm-hmm. It's pretty damn good. Yeah. Now speaking of of life altering losses, you suffered a loss at Burning Man that we really <laughs> want to talk about. Um, you had this pretty bitch in airstream. Yeah. You towed it out to the desert. It's like <laughs> one of the first lessons I took away from Burning Man was that uh, when you try to force things, I think that don't that aren't the necessary. Well. I don't know. Everything's perfect. Nothing matters. So I'm, uh, you know, this has happened exactly how it was supposed to. Let it ride. Which, which, yeah, right. And so, like, a lot of uh, uh, my girlfriend um, went to Burning Man the time before. Um, Jess, Jess, uh, her name's Jess Hart. Um, she's um, she's a pretty special human being. She pushes me in a lot of ways. Um, she's she's been a professional model for twenty plus years and has made a career in it. So she moved to Japan when she was fifteen years old didn't graduate high school, learned through the world and has the craziest life experiences that I like felt like I, I met a female version of myself a little bit. And, and in the sense that she's been, you know, traveling her whole career. And one of the things she swore by was that we, uh, we had to do Burning Man together. So she's like, okay, cool. I got the camp. It's really hard to get the right camp. It's really like, I got the, I got us dialed. It's like 15 grand for, um, for the, the space at the camp. And that includes like, it's five. Well, it was like five grand a person. And we ended up bringing f- uh, four of us, five of us. Mm-hmm. And that comes with all the food, all like that you're taking care of for the whole experience, except for your, your housing. So we're like five grand a person. Okay. Well, like that's not that bad. We're going to drive there. Like it's not that dumb. And then you're like, Oh wait, but it's like 20 grand to rent a bus. And, you know, so like, cause everybody's wise to what, what happens to the RVs in Southern California, Northern <laughs> California, Nevada, what the whole West coast, that specific week of the year. Potentially yeah. for good reason. It right. Like. Right. And, and it's what it is, is the, um, the alkaline dust of the lake of the dry lake bed. It's like a desert, basically the playa is what they call it. It, um, gets into in everything, yep. literally everything and destroys it. It's like, it's, it's, um, it's like, yeah, it's, it, it, it just destroys materials and it's really hard to get out. So, um, you know how they tape the RVs up and whatever. Anyway, long story short, I couldn't justify, you know, I was like, I'll take care of the RV. I have a better plan. Don't worry. <laughs> Got it yeah. all figured My out. My friend had an activation rig from Nissan. that was like this matte black Airstream trailer. I'm like, who paints an Airstream black? And it was like been beat in the sun for the last like five years. It hadn't been used for five years. They bought it. It was like a 97 Airstream. They, uh, 
they they had it remodeled they put 70 grand into making it um making it like uh activation rig for nissan which included painting it putting new cabinets and it, it looked like a orange county like dated w hotel what's an activation rig uh basically it's like a, a rig used to bring to racetracks or different places um where nissan could brag about things so they okay. had like tvs on it and and it, um, you know, like a sound system, and it was like a meet, little inter a meeting room. So it went to the racetracks where the Nissan was racing at, and it had like a Nissan Nismo branding on it. And anyway, so it was like beat. And my friend was like, "I'll sell it to you for eleven grand." I was like, "Oh, that's cool. That's a good deal. Like those things are worth like you know they're like one hundred and fifty new for like a top of the line Airstream, and to like buy used one, it was like you know twenty to forty, like from that. And and he just put seventy into it, and, I, and he said eleven grand. I'm like, this is sweet. So naturally I figured I'll take care of the Airstream. I could do this. I, I like to do projects and I have plenty of spare time. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile, I can't respond to text messages. That's, that's uh, what I've really caught about you is you've got just tons of spare time in your life. Tons of spare time. So never busy, never yeah. busy. <laughs> and, uh, um, get, so I got the Airstream, got a month and a half until, uh, until, uh, Burning Man starts. And it's a big deal. Everybody's like panicking about it already. I'm panicking. I'm like, I don't, you know, people around me get stressed. I get calm. Like, I just like, whatever, it's going to happen. It's fine. Um, to a fault. And, uh, uh, meanwhile, we get, we get a job in Hungary for formula one. So we fly to Hungary. We to take ASAP Ferg to go experience formula one. So we did a bunch of, we did like five viral videos with him with complex magazine viral videos. That's an old term. So we did five, uh, digital content pieces, uh, with ASAP Ferg and, uh, <laughs> that took up a lot of energy because uh you know taking a like superstar rapper to hungary is um is challenging uh and uh, everybody's doing it these yeah, days if you haven't taken your superstar rapper to, to hungary, hungary what are you doing with your life you're not, really not doing anything <laughs> uh the highlight was the water park um we'll leave it at that um so anyway <laughs> <laughs> you have to go behind our paywall to get the rest of that story <laughs> so we uh <laughs> we, we, we did this thing and we came back Anyway, I, I'm like on my flight back. I'm like, uh, you know, Jess has been in my ear. Like, you got to get this done. Like you, you've been, you know, like the Airstream. And I'm like, yeah, I, I got it. And I, I, uh, I had somebody kind of set up to help me with it. And, um, I gave him some marching orders before I left. So I figured I'd come back to like a pretty, you know, close project. Came back to a shell, um, with a uh, black, half black paint and nothing inside of it at all. Oof. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So I, I, I like to, I'm detail oriented to a fault, I guess. And, uh, right before I left, I tore everything out of it because I was like, we could do better. And, uh, I intended on you reusing a lot of the stuff. And anyway, um, uh, it was really, really challenging to remodel an Airstream in two weeks. So I like killed myself. I'd stayed up two days in a row, like or three days in a row, two nights. Like, I mean, I had naps here and there, but no, two nights of no sleep. I didn't leave the shop. I mean, I was like in like, it was it was really hard to recruit people to work on an airstream so i had a few people in and out like but at the most part for the most part somebody be like i'll help you with this and then like they'd come in and like do a little bit and then like leave me hanging because go i get it like you don't want to spend a week remodeling an airstream with me but it it it, it was a lot and so i almost killed myself doing this and the girls my girlfriend her two best friends who had never been to burning man my girlfriend had we, we, if you pay extra and know the right people, you can get early access passes, which is like part of the experience. You get into the playa before anybody else and you get to like be a part of it, become turning into what it is and coming alive. So like, you know, that was supposed to, we're supposed to leave on like Friday, Friday rolls around. The thing is like, I'm, I'm almost done. I had like one cabinet up, like <laughs> just <laughs> about like, there. They were like, you're not almost done. I'm like, I know. You know. I'm like, I was delusional at this point. I'm like, no, it's almost done. Trust me. I was and then literally, you t- and then you turn around. You're like, oh shit. It's not like, I'm literally standing in like bl- blood covered, like, you know, just like beat to death. Just like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing kind of situation. Anyways, it almost kills me. We end up getting on the road three days late. Burning Man actually starts on like the Tuesday. Um, three days late and I'm defeated and I'm just apologetic. And I'm like, I, f- I don't like missing deadlines. I don't like failing. I don't like that. I, but I failed and, and I hated it. And, um, I had to admit that and I apologized and, um, you know, the girls were, were fine and understanding, but I, I was disappointed in myself. Roll into Burning Man 5 AM, um, to Tuesday of the start of Burning Man. Um, so we, we actually weren't really late. We were there right when everybody started showing up and, um, um, Anyway, they, our rig looked really dope. We have a partnership with Mercedes Benz, so we had a Sprinter that was all decked out, race service, and then um, and then we had the matching Airstream that was like 
perfectly chromed out, like a, a lum, polished aluminum out. It was just like this mirrored finish, beautiful Airstream. Justin spent all this energy putting curtains and candles and beautiful love into the interior. It felt like a new house. It was so epic. And there was four of us meant to stay in this thing. So me and Jess and then her two girlfriends in the front on the, um, the, the two twin beds in the front. And, uh, and so we all get there and they're lovely. Like, like, so like thankful they saw me kill myself over this project. And so I, I, uh, you know, the first day, like it's all, you have to give back to the playa. Like you have to work to, to, to like earn your keep and every camp has to give something. Every person has to give to the camp. When you leave, you leave the, the, the ground, you clean your footprints away. So there's literally no trace that, that ever happened. You leave it better than you let, you got there. Um, and, uh, so our camp decided to, we set up a dance floor, a basketball court, a DJ booth. We had like really dope crew, like very much like the cool kids, like kind of like, you know, felt like high school a little bit. We had all like matching gear and like really rad people. And, um, so I'm, you know, they put us front and center, um, right over the basketball court and the DJ booth and the bar. And we were like to offer free drinks to the whole playa. Anybody who wants to come by, you can have, we had beer on tap, we had kombucha on tap and we had water, like really good, like healthy water. So um, first bartending duty is the girls and me. And we're like all in matching gear. Like I'm more, like we had like, Jess brought swimsuits for everybody. So the girls are in like these super rad swimsuits. And, I, you know, matching army green gear with our logos on it and, and just vibes are right. And Jess is like, just stay back, chill. Like, I know you want to get the final like cabinet adjusted. And like, uh, I like t just wanted to dial the final things that I didn't have a chance to do because we were like rushing to get out of town. So I get everything dialed perfectly. And Jess comes in. She's like, hey, babe, we got to go. You got to work. You got to participate. So I come out and the music is amazing. We had the DJ Ruckus, this really dope DJ DJing for everybody. And like in this great outfit and like people are just vibing so well, ba playing basketball. It's the middle of the day. And I'm behind the bar. I'm like, this is dope. Like we're here. We made it. Like, and I start tending bar. Everything's great. Um, one of the girls says, Hey, I'm going to go grab, grab a cigarette. I, uh, um, how do I ash it? And then they, um, and then at that point I'm like, okay, we're kind of like, it's chill for a second. I'm going to go get some clothes that I didn't unpack out of the sprinter, bring it back into the thing, go to the sprinter, get a handful of clothes, go to walk into the airstream, open the airstream door. No, back up a little bit. P Diddy show, puff, puff daddy shows up and I'm like, okay, I heard he was going to be a part of our camp. Like everybody is vibing. Cause they're like, puff is the man. He, he's like Bernie man staple. He, he like loves the idea of it being a place where you can, um, free your mind and just be yourself. And, um, so he shows up and high fives everybody. And I'm like, my like childhood hero is like, here, what's up, Puff? <laughs> Whomst amongst <laughs> us hasn't been in that Five. party before. <laughs> and it was like this dope moment of like, whoa, what the fuck? And so um, I'm like, cool, cool. All right, yeah, Puff. Yeah, see you, man. See you later. Um, and then I go. Is this your first time meeting him? Yeah, this is my first time meeting him. My girlfriend's close with them and known him for years. I think they 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 know each other from New York and their circle of friends and then um, but did Bernie Man together the year prior. But you're just super busy trying to act cool at this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just totally, you know, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm just, just playing it off. Just a normal dude puff, from Beaverton. Puffy daddy. Gotta be cool. <laughs> <laughs> gotta blend in. Gotta be yeah. cool. <laughs> so anyway, I think I passed the first test. The second test was not um, burning down the camp in front of everybody. And I failed that one. <sighs> <sighs> So we're Tarantinoing this story a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so literally I'm running back, I get the clothes and I'm running back or walking back, just like dancing, whatever. I got my clothes. Hey everybody. I open the door of the airstream. Flames are fucking pouring out of this, this trailer. Like you've never seen black and, and red flames, flames and smoke. Like you, you could not believe, like didn't literally no sign of smoke when you look at the trailer, but Jess had taped it up with Gorilla Glue has this beautiful clear tape. It's called frog tape. Which is incredibly strong. Shout frog frog tape. Shout out to frog tape. Thanks for making this happen. So we we frog taped the, every scene. Jess had a lot to do while I was trying to finish the airstream. It, I mean, in other words, she had nothing. She had a lot of time to kill. Sure. So she decided to frog tape every seam on the airstream, so you didn't get the alkaline dust into the stuff and ruin our nice new bedding and clothes and all that. Yeah, so the yeah. thing was sealed like you it was sealed and and when we were you know we got a little bit of a nap when we first got into air stream and it it was beautiful the air conditioning was cranking it was like cold as fuck in there and all, all, it was just great it was like we made it we this is it i can't believe we finished it and uh anyway 
um, walk into the airstream, flames everywhere. And I'm like, holy <laughs> shit, throw my clothes as hard as I ca- possibly could at, for dramatics onto the, onto the playa, jump in with a tank top and swim shorts on, and I'm kicking all the flames out of the thing. I'm just like kicking everything Good, flaming you. out to the playa. Meanwhile, somebody's like, keep it off the playa. I hear somebody yelling, keep it off the playa. That's how serious <laughs> people are about, about Dude. trashing, p- putting uh, putting any kind of like, dirt or any outside things any onto mark the play. whatsoever right so i'm trying to save my life and the rest of the camp's life and i'm in there choking flames everything i mean i think i kick all the stuff out somebody hands me a fire extinguisher and i blast the whole interior with uh, with uh fire fire extinguisher dust like an idiot so not only but but literally it destroyed it it was like the, the the walls had melted. It would sucked everything so hard. And I, of course, thought it was my fault. So I'm carrying all this stuff in. Flames are billowing out of this thing. I, I somehow don't die. My shoes melt into the floor. But I somehow kicked all the melting stuff. It seemed to be contained to one little front area of the airstream. Um, and, and so one person, as I'm kicking all this out, and I'm like, I look at Jess from across the thing, and I look at her, and she looks at me like, holy shit. This is embarrassing. And I'm like, I, and, my, and these are the eye, these are what we said with our eyes. And I'm like, I did this. I'm sorry. You know, like, <laughs> of course, what's going through my head is I like electrical fire sure. or something. Like, we just remodeled this thing. I was like putting on light fixtures right before I walked out. Turns out you do need sleep. Turns out you need sleep. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the, 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 Damage was contained to one, the, the origin, like I felt like a fire investigator, but the origin was very clearly from the box of, of electronics or trash right by the door. And mind you, one hour prior to this, we had two propane tanks right next to that. Oh my God. Yeah. Literally just took them out right before the party started. And, uh, and literally somebody, some guy, one person's yelling, keep it off the playa. The other person's yelling, it's the battery pack. And the, the year prior, uh, Paris Hilton um, had gift, gifted the, the camp a battery pack that said, um, or her boyfriend at the time that turns out nobody liked anyway. So it's all good. Fair. Uh, that had the logo of the camp on it. And it was like a rechargeable battery pack that, you you, you know, you definitely you would use on the solar powered battery pack. So there's a lot of th- questionable things in that. Nobody had really used it until this year. Anyway, that battery pack was melted into the ground next to the, in, out of the box that was burnt. And then the bag of trash was completely melted and gone, including my shoes. So wait, the Jordans? The Jor- no, different Jordans. These were oh, for the God. gifted Jordans. Another okay. pair of Jordans. Uh, yeah, so, right. so, I was going to make it through this story. Yeah. So, I know. So, uh, anyway, I, uh, man, uh, I, I, I crisis, uh, you know, I, I went into a crisis. What do you call it when you, uh, mitigation? You crisis the shit out you of crisis it. crisis the shit out of this. And I was like, Airstream off the right. Literally, the DJ turns on, uh, uh, what's a song about burning? We didn't start the yeah, fire. Yeah, they put on that song. And I looked at him and I was like, or if he put on one of those songs. It's Let the iconic. motherfucker burn. Yeah. Yeah, so one of the burning songs. I don't the know, but it was fire. fitting that we started with burning, burning our airstream down. down the house. Yeah, that's what it was. All burning right. down the house. I knew we'd get there. Yeah, that was it. I was like, God damn it. <laughs> so funny. Uh, anyway, I went to like <laughs> crisis mode and was like super embarrassed. Of course, most people are going to assume that it's, like, but luckily that man had yelled out the battery pack and, and there was a cell phone melted into the trash hanging over the ledge of the person that had just asked me where to ash. I don't know. I didn't want to put it on her. I didn't want We're to ruin here her to trip. And blame. Yeah. But I we might, really want to know whose fault it was. Yeah. But you know what? I don't really, at this point, you know, in the Burning Man way, it didn't matter. Uh, at least I didn't feel like I burnt down the place. At least we, it was some figure that nobody liked and it wasn't there that year. So anyway, flash that. forward it like 30 <laughs> minutes later, I'm in the back sweeping all like ru- everything in the thing ruined everything. There's just black over everything. All, everything melted off the walls. The, like the wood had warped off of everything. It was ruined. Oh the thing goodness. was a hot flaming pill. It had been sealed inside. The sealed flame inside was sealed inside. Because of gr- frog tape. I'd like to thank frog tape for being a sponsor. Uh, what do I do with my hands? Thank you, frog tape. <laughs> Way to go, frog tape. It was a deep fried Twinkie from the inside. It was a deep fried Twinkie. <laughs> and uh but what? but i'm i'm sitting there just defeated still right i mean i'm like lungs full of smoke and defeat and fire hydrant suffocation dust and uh the paris hilton runs up and she's like oh my god i can't believe that fucker burnt down your airstream and start burning man for me because that was like the uh, like the beginning of a very very special nine days of just really rad experiences. Turns out we had a, uh, one of the guests didn't show up with with his, uh, you know, multi million dollar tour bus. 
uh, I think it was a marathon. Um, was it an Oregon based yeah, marathon yeah, or was it a, it was a Prevost. Oh, it was a Prevost, but a very much in the same style of, of bus that we grew up idolizing and wishing we could own one day. Anyway, we got us, we upgraded our, you know, $11,000 Airstream into a multi-million dollar tour bus. Way to turn week. it around. Yeah, That's we turned boom, that baby. around <laughs> and then spent the next couple of weeks partying with Puff Daddy and Paris Hilton. It was pretty epic. Wow. Yeah, but you know what? Way everything's go, perfect and nothing matters. Way to go, Paris, for stepping in, making you feel better right at that right moment. Yeah. Gosh. She and to be, she's I, not going to blame anybody. She's no, not thinking. So, well, I mean, not you that's specifically. It. Yeah. I will say that she is one of the raddest human beings on the planet. I, she got a lot of bad press, but she is very, very. You know, we were a product. Those those unique individuals are very much products of of us. You know, and what we've done to them, and and she's given all of that. She's an incredible human. The fact that she's kind of lived through probably the the moment that we all think of her. You know, her her moment of fame, uh, living through all that wild press that she got, and and kind of been come through on the other side. I'm just, I'm sure she's yeah. fantastic and the queen of social media. Really, she was the start of it all. Yeah, right. Yeah. What a wild idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah, fa- like later that night, it's me, Jess, and Paris riding bikes around Burning Man and going into wandering into random parties, you know, stirring up trouble. It was like, just where are we? You know, it was, but but it's very much like what I was talking about earlier. We were like, it just it was a special, uh, like kind of gauge on on just life in general. Like it's just we could make it way more serious and. Uh, you know, it's we're all so guilty of of um, making it so serious, and it doesn't need to be. It's just doesn't. It's just you know, have fun and do what makes you happy, and the rest kind of works out. So you and Nate, as kids in high school, kicking it in the basement. Do you ever, in a million years, think that you'd find yourself just paddling around the playa with Paris and your, you know, model girlfriend, and <laughs> just living life? And I, you know, I don't know. I guess I kind of. Always uh, hoped. I don't know. Yeah, no, definitely not. Yeah, I mean, it's weird. It's weird. We uh, we were talking earlier. We did the Puff Daddy's fiftieth birthday last week, and um, pretty epic experience. We got to show up for uh, like the I would say like the party of the century. <laughs> Especially like, it was insane. It was like at one point. So we got invited, obviously based on our relationship with him, but Burning Man and Jess's relationship with him prior and. It, the other people there were like, you know, at one point we're on the dance floor and it's like, you know, look up Dwayne Wade standing next to Puff and, 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 and full circle Snoop's there smoking blunts <laughs> next to him. Does he remember you? Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, it, you know, it takes some reminding sure. because it was a long time ago and I was a, a little weird, but yeah. That was yeah. It was a weird time of life, but it's like, hey, uh, Frank for... Cooper, you know me. Uh, oh yeah. What's you know what's up? You Did know? he call you nephew? And, yeah, you probably call me nephew. It's probably a goal in my life. Yeah. Just to, if, nephew. If if Snoop calls you nephew, you've made it in life. Yeah, it, yeah. It was. That's what I felt when I was, especially like you my can't first tell me shit. Me, yeah, Snoop called me nephew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so good. But so so we had Snoop. Then the next then Kim and Kanye and and Pharrell and um, Jay Z and Beyonce. Like and we're at Buff's house. This is a house party. Sure. So like and then, then we end up the night at this after party, no bigger than this room, maybe a little bit bigger. Probably bigger, probably as big as these two rooms and on the same level, a little smaller. Uh, with like, you know, I walk in at the time, like we grew up listening to like Nelly Country Grammar and they were playing all the people's songs that were there. And like, you know, like we walk up into this little room and, and it's like Nelly and and Jay-Z and 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 Kanye and g Easy and like all these like figures that like, it's just weird. And um, it just makes life feel that much more like, yeah, it's like we idolize these people, but at the end of the day, we're all the same. We just like people doing, and and, and and that just goes to say, like, do you know? Don't have to know what you're doing all the time, but just do what the fuck you want. Have fun with it. That's amazing. Yeah, Rick Rubin does a pod um, where he talks to a lot of people like that, and they kind of get into the what was your frame of mind? What were you thinking about when you wrote whatever you know, world famous, iconic song? Do you ever find yourself in a room with people like that and just want to be like? what were you thinking when you know you were like hot shit and then country grammar fell out of your mouth yeah that that that, that beat dropped and 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 i look back and nelly and g easy is dapping nelly for like making that song and i'm doing the same and and he's rapping every lyric and you're just like yeah what more so for me like especially that that how influential puff was in in that whole movement like, yeah 
to be at his house with Usher nominating everybody in the room or nominating Puff in front of everybody in the room for being the leader of that movement that very much influenced my life. Well, um, he's like the Frank Sinatra of that group. I mean, which yeah. is wild to think because, right. you know, you're with the J and, yeah. you know, and you'd be hard pressed to find a rapper more influential than Jay. But, but really it seems like Puff is the guy that like the glue that brings all he those really guys together. was. And that's what Usher said. He's like, you, you, you created this and it like got the room got quiet and he's like, I get chills thinking about it right now. He's like, really though, you created all of this. And, and it was a really cool moment where everybody would like stop talking, stop drinking, stop everything. And was like, yep. Like really, and to be there for that was really cool. And then to cap it off later that night with, you know, Nelly, rhyming country grammar with J G E Z hitting on my girl, <laughs> you know, like. I mean, you know who hasn't been <laughs> I there? Was like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Wow, yeah. man, it That's was just it was stuff. it was just cool, but I, you know, yeah, like, but but what I take from those moments is, like, just to be exposed to other people's way of life and to like living highly in that flow state. Yeah. I think that's probably what you get from Rick Rubin's podcast too. Cause I think Rick Rubin's a phenomenal human being and he has the ability to draw things out of people. And he's like a, a figurehead in, in that space. And right. like, and to be able to like pull, pull people's take on life out of their head in like a really artful way is, is something really special. And I think, I think that that's for me, what I get from those types of experiences and from those types of interviews um, is, is that like life is, is really short. And it's really, um, really as simple as just doing what you love and being confident in doing that. And, um, and so I, I try to take away from, from those experiences is like, okay, open to a whole new level of possibility and opportunity. And, um, yeah, that's what I took away from that night. That's gotta be inspirational just to be in a moment with, with people like that and just know like, you know, Hey, these guys have done it. I can go out and do it. Like just being around like-minded people that, yeah. You know. really normalizes that kind of stuff yeah and just makes it not seem so like uh like crazy right it's not un unattainable when you're in a room full of people that have that have attained it yeah yeah and i think that yeah, goes exactly. back to being with the right people right and yeah. surrounding yourself with the right people so yeah i try to try to challenge myself in those ways but yeah really also i mean big ups to usher for being the guy that gave the speech right, right? <laughs> not only is the man a badass dancer right but he can he can give a speech that that stops a room. Yeah, yeah, so. he's he was an icon, man. I, uh, yeah, he, he um, that was special seeing him there. I think um, I'm trying to remember the song. He walked into the party and it was like slow motion. Like I forget what song they had. Um, Love in the club. Uh, sure, yeah. Love in the club. Sure. Cue it. Okay, that. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, that that moment, it, it, like he like walked in and swam in slow motion through the crowd, and it was just like this weird moment. We're like, where the fuck are we? And so then, yeah. you know, you're not supposed to wear, like, if you go to a concert, you're not supposed to wear the band's T-shirt to right. a concert, right? Mm -hmm. um, apparently, that's not the case, though. If that person's in the room, you are supposed to play their song. So this was a special occasion, like where they were playing all the songs of all the people there, and it was it. I knew every lyric to every single song they played, sure. and it was annoying to everybody with me. Now it was it was more so <laughs> funny because it was just like this. Really, you could just see how impactful it was, and everybody was like lip syncing every lyric, you know. What a it, wild it, thing. It was cool. It was really, it was really special. But that, that, um, yeah. Uh, if I'm DJ in that room though, I'm scared shitless. Yeah. A lot of oh, pressure yeah. on that. Yeah. That guy's job is, is cause I would just, I would seriously be like, I don't know who to play. Dude, they had this, this, <laughs> uh, what is it? Eric B. Eric B. MC'd the end of it. And, Are you serious? Yeah. The whole, the whole end of it. And, um, he had this like, I don't know. I probably should know who this dude is because everybody else knew him. I don't know who it was. But um, this young white kid with like a flashy suit and like a top hat, and he was DJing the whole thing, and just like this little kid, and uh, like, son of a bitch, Mason Ramsey. <laughs> yeah, it was so dumb. I don't know who it was. I have no idea. Um, but he like was controlling the room and playing all these bangers. Um, and yeah, there was just a lot of respect given for everybody in the room on that. You know, like, and so I was doing my job to make sure when like somebody was was around that was like you know, somebody that I cared about or like was influential in my life, I'd, I'd let them know. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that that's the best way. I wasn't fanning out, but you know, the weekend was like chilling by himself, like awkwardly, like having a drink and um, trying to like find something to do with his time. And I went and talked, was like, yo, you're like the mo like most influential artist of modern time right now for me. And props, thank you. And and he was very receptive to that, especially in that environment where you're not like feeling attacked. There was no security guards allowed there, so like you had all the Kardashians there with no security guards. 
Mm-hmm. There probably aren't a lot of rooms in the world that the weekend would be in where he wasn't the number one attraction. Right. So if he's sitting there, I mean, because I, you know, the one thing you that you hear about people that are that level of famous, um, sometimes there's some insecurities there. Yeah, for and, sure. And they're used to having the spotlight on them. Yeah. So if you go into that and you're the fiftieth brightest burning light, it's a little awkward. You know, maybe you do need someone to yeah. just slide up and be like, dude. Kanye was bummed. Let's put it that way. Yeah. No, I mean, I love Kanye West, but. He, yeah, he was not in party vibes. He was, seems to me like the kind of guy that potentially needs to have the brightest light on him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a good a way to bit. put it. Kanye has been a, a, a frequent contributor to our conversation here on this pod. So <laughs> I think last time we talked about him becoming a pastor and Kim becoming a lawyer. So The whole entire time you've been like describing like everybody in the room and hearing their songs and stuff like that. I think of that uh, Aziz and Sorry joke. With uh, oh, with, with Kanye and he plays his like own music. He like invites him over yep. and stuff, and he's playing his own. He's like, man, this beat's dope, and it's like his own <laughs> song and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a good name, have, have you guys seen the Facebook commercial portal with Kim and uh, um, who is uh, Puff's ex-wife, uh, a kid, Jenny uh, from the Block? Oh, J Lo. J Lo, thank you. Yeah, she's. It's it drives me nuts. I can't stand it. Um, is it pretty bad? It's. Yeah, Jen's helping Kim study, and then some dude walks in like, "Hey, Jen, I thought we were gonna go hit the slopes." Hey, Jen, or Kim, you're a lawyer, do something. Oh, she's like, "I wow. choose not to accept the case," uh, and then he's like, "Objection!" She's like, "Overruled," or the other way around, whatever. However, wow. it, I can't. I only stand watch it. Portal well, commercials with the Muppets. J Lo, uh, yeah, J Lo's worth watching still. By the way, I don't know yeah, if you guys I, have seen the most recent movie, Hustler. Dude, Hustlers, fifty Hustlers. You so need good to go watch. You need to go watch Hustlers if you like J Lo at all. She's incredible right now. She's I'm like, she, has she, like she, yeah. Has she ever not been incredible? Well, yeah. I mean, but what? She's 50 years old. Think about this. She's incredible. Think about this. As a fly girl, right where she started, might be the least hot she's ever been. This is a wild thought. Her and Jennifer Aniston just don't know when to stop. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I think there's some technology out there and some some advancements in modern medical that I'm happy with. Yeah. If, if they had to spoil that on two people, I think they've done a fine job. Yeah. I'm glad I'm not the one who had to pick that and, uh, and good job by whoever did. And yeah, JLo is JLo and Jen, Jen Ann, Jen Ann, we'll call her Jen Ann. Ann. They're two good choices for sure. So when, uh, you you see Anaconda, like it's the first JLo movie that ever came out and she was, sounds like I need to see this. I don't um, remember. It's a good movie. Yeah. So pretty good. It's mm. like who, it was, who else I've seen Anaconda movie? for sure. I just yeah. yeah yeah. Who's the other guy that's in that? John Boyd. That's right. Angelina Jolie's dad. Okay, and somebody what? else. Is Ice Cube in that movie? Maybe Ice Cube's in that. Is movie. it? Ice I Cube? think you're thinking of Snakes on a Plane. No, no. Well, I joking. think you're right. I think it's Ice Cube. But Something I went to like see that. I whatever twenty year old Casey O'Toole goes and watches that movie in Roseburg, and I'm sitting there and I'm I'm like I don't know who this girl is, but she's beautiful. I think I can date her. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got a I shot. Because she's like whatever the Said fifth built person on this. And yeah, and I walk out of there going, yeah, I don't know how I'm going to get the Hollywood, but I got to meet this. <laughs> One this, way ticket, please. Yeah, I'm going to meet this person. <laughs> and uh, and yeah. then, yeah, now, I mean, I guess A-Rod swooped in, yeah. but whatever. I will say, though, the Hustlers or Hustler, whatever it's called, the movie about J-Lo. And, the, and I think Cardi B is in it, but she doesn't play like a main role. Um, but it's about a bunch of strippers making a career in hustling dudes in New York and based on a true story based on true and like loose true encounters, I guess pretty epic movie actually. Yeah. Really good. Yeah. It was, and All right. like I said, yeah, it was worth the, uh, worth the watch. So check Is it she out. one you've ever met in person? Jayla? No, I, she's one I've seen, but I've never met her. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She's the one that I'd be like, I will say I went to another similar party a year, year ago. Uh, Jamie Foxx has a grant, uh, BET awards after party at his yeah. house in at North of Calabasas. So it's like 45 North minutes North of LA. My friend was like, Hey, we can go to Jamie Foxx's after party. It's this iconic party and you have no idea. Like, so it's like incredibly hard to get in, but we walk in and like a slow motion moment. They had, they take your phone from you after like thinking it's going to be impossible to get in, take your phone from you, walk in. And then Lil Kim's singing. I'm like, what the, well, Lil Kim, like Biggie's what? B- uh, Tupac, Big- Biggie, Lil- like first I fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, <laughs> in the night, the last scene of the night for me, J-Lo's, I mean, uh, um, 
Lil Kim's freak dancing on me. And uh, like, I'm in the recording studio in the back behind the pool where Kanye West through the wire is recorded. And I'm like, once again, the only white person in the room, sure, and like yeah. there's life moments of like, yeah, that was a good one. Lil Kim and Lil Kim was there that night. That, uh, so if you're there. listening to this and you're a 17 year old <laughs> kid in Beaverton, Oregon, sitting in the suburbs uh, and you're thinking, you know, how am I going to get there? What am I going to do? Um, listen, just take notes. Because mm-hmm. at least one of us has made it out and figured it all out. <laughs> <laughs> day by day. Day we'll by day. What touch the and go. fuck <laughs> am I doing? You really are the poster child for this podcast. Yeah, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> are we going to go karting? Are you going to go show everybody that you can beat me at karting right now? I watched you in a race last night. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, was it, was it, it was, did, I uh, did I win? Slow guy, fast. No. Oh. Slow guy, fast car, fast guy, slow guy. Oh, you, what? oh with Humphrey. Fast driver. Yeah. 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 That one did well. That was funny. That was really funny. That was really fun to do. I enjoyed that a lot. That was like the early days of GoPro. Or I mean, Donut. Donut. Yeah. yeah. What? So did you guys ever swap cars at that point and then see how fast you could go in the, in the Mercedes? Um, I don't know that we ever did. I mean, it was like, you know, he doesn't have much track track experience at all. So it You're was a nice really, guy because it, yeah. he beat you in a significantly nicer car. Yeah. Uh, and I would I have forget been, the whole, the, the whole setup for that, but I was in like a, his terrible rental car. Yeah. Yeah. With and, baby seats. That's in right. It. Baby seats. Yeah. You <laughs> kissed him one of the babies in one point. That's right. Yeah. For those who haven't seen it, it was, they were, they were baby dolls, not actual babies. Uh, and then they, they, <laughs> The counterpart in your race was was in a 330 horsepower Mercedes. I, of some I think sort. I was like a uh, like a lot. Like I think I did. I did. I'm sure I for my ego. I'm sure I made sure that everybody on set knew what actually happened. I was expecting because I, I was watching the video and I was like, well, if it's me, I'm jumping in the fast car to show everyone that I can beat the minute 32 or whatever that mm. he did. Because you didn't lose by much. Yeah, I, I I think I was like probably over 10, 15 seconds faster in the, or like a, a significant amount, I think when, and yeah. when I hopped in the other car, I mean, to be fair, like that was the whole point was like to show, to show that like, yeah, a car can make all the difference. Well, especially in that, like it was like a rental car or something. You watch. So, so you like, he races, you get the time and you're like instantly like, Oh, I got this. And then you hop in the car. The ne- the very next clip is you taking off in <laughs> Possibly the slowest car ever. I said, I think I said I don't got this right, 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 right when it started. (laughs) At least, if even if you didn't, as as soon as you took off, in my mind, that's what I thought was, you don't got this. I don't got this. I remember thinking that, and then I started just cutting the course. Yeah, I was just jumping off road, and yeah, yeah. I thought I had it really still, and I I I lost. That was that was. I have two last questions. Yeah. Uh, Last question number one. Um, as you guys are, are whatever young dudes chilling here in, in the outskirts of Portland, um, what was your dream car then? And have you attained that sense? Mm. A man who, who has a serious relationship with Mercedes and mm. has a, the only Ferrari I've ever seen with bumper stickers. <laughs> <laughs> bumper stickers. I love them without. What was your dream car? Yeah. I, I'd have to go with uh, Ferrari yeah. and uh, Which Ferrari? Just any Ferrari? Just, I, I just it's the Magnum PI Ferrari. I'd have to agree with you on that one, but really just Ferrari in general. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, but yeah, the McLaren P1. Yeah. Oh, geez. For, back then. I mean, Doesn't I had suck. that car in Need for Speed and this little steering wheel combo set right. hooked up to my little same. oversized computer. I had that same thing with the PlayStation. And like, oh, I just, I would, <laughs> I could spend hours with that damn car. Now, Nate, on the flip, what's the, what is the coolest car you've ever got to drive? The Ferrari, um, for the turkey shoot mm. and then drop it in off in that really sketch neighborhood mm. with no cell phone res- service waiting for an uber that wouldn't pick me up and then a lift <laughs> that barely picked me up <laughs> and my phone was about to die That's, yeah that car was fun we almost broke it a handful of times all right uh for me um my my car growing up i wanted is like a daily driver it was probably like a, a ferrari or porsche race car of any kind that i could like modify to be legal on the streets so. sure I wanted like a GT3 RS Porsche, and um, and now I drive a AMG GTR, pretty much race car for the streets, which is like a Porsche killer that Mercedes made, and uh, it's the most loud, obnoxious muscle car. F you in your face, hurts your ears to be in it, blasts everybody's ears when you're driving around them, especially sideways. And the yeah, black get, one, yeah, uh, right now. So Mercedes um, took back the black one, which was actually green, but it was wrapped black. 
and gave us a brand new 2020 AMG GTR, brand new yellow, solar beam yellow is just there like mm-hmm. I saw flagship the, the yellow next to the green. Yeah. I saw the picture. It's so good. When, it when Mercedes fun. gives you a car like that, what happens if you wreck it? Um, Insurance? No comment. No comment. <laughs> I've never well, wrecked that car. things are coming, car. everybody. I've never wrecked that car. So um, I'd like to real quick no, interrupt insurance, and, really. and say, Porsche, if you're upset by his comment, feel free to donate a Porsche to me, and we'll put we'll go head to head. Let's do it. We'll, we'll do an experiment. I will it. say the AMG GTR is the uh, fastest production car in the Nurburgring um, to date, and that's what they've built it for, and they've successfully done that, beat all the Lamborghinis and Ferraris and. Um, in that category, I think there's a category like of like hyper supercars that are not very mass produced. They're like super, right? Yeah, whatever, that unattainable. But as far as like the mass produced supercars, AMG has got the got the flag. So, wow. and I would like to ask, what is it like to drive on the Nurburgring? Because that's kind of the iconic racetrack that everybody knows. Man, and it's fun. We had it rented for a couple of days for a, a shoot over Fourth of July. So we were in Fourth of July in Germany with a bunch of Americans doing a Ford shoot. Um, we had we had fireworks uh, to just make sure that they knew we were there, um, but it was really fun. I mean, we had the whole racetrack, and it was raining the first day, so we just ran it backwards in rental cars all day just for fun. So uh, it was like, cool. It was like a life. It was like a. It's as hard as it was to be away from America on Fourth of July. We did the second best thing, which is invade Germany with fireworks and Fords. <laughs> <laughs> America. Yeah. Oh my God! Yeah. How many times the America? Fuck yeah! yeah. <laughs> Every time, every time we travel. To the That's place. amazing. Yeah. All right, last question. Um, what's next for Famous James? Famous James, good nickname. That's what I I I, uh, I was done that a long time ago. Um, man, uh, we're gonna keep doing what we do in the automotive space, and um, we're we're looking for race services. I'm more excited about like as far as digital content goes. It's like I'm. You know, I, I, we have a team that's handling that and doing doing great things for the brands that we work with. Um, I'm focusing on the brand development and uh, um, apparel and coffee and the scalability of what we do and, and giving people experiences in cars. So looking at a number of different businesses within the race service space, like we would like to purchase a racetrack and do what we do times, you know, whatever to the, to the next extent um, in a physical space that you can race cars at. Uh, we have one in mind. Uh, we're putting together some people to maybe do that, uh, where we put a hotel and um, and 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 have like the automotive experience really um, in one space. And then uh, we need to figure out a scalable um, um, business model out of what we do already that um, that is right. So you know, you see a lot of businesses that um, are, are asset lists that are are based on ideas and apps and technology. And so we're looking at kind of ways we can do what what our core value and our mission is, which is to like spread the enjoyment of racing cars and the love for racing cars and make racing cool and elevate the style in racing, um, and automotive culture, um, generally. Um, and, and so we're looking at, um, uh, at some, some different ideas that, that could be app based or experience based. Um, but, but my focus now is, is, is based on, or is, and my focus is now, um, looking at, at the you know, human, face-to-face experience and less about the digital footprint so i think i think that's important i think the world's needing more uh, real interaction with human beings so we're looking for ways we can we can increase uh, the the uh, automotive culture in the real world and not the, to just the digital world so and your coffee events that you guys have every wednesday right yeah those have really taken off yeah and been- it's really cool what you've done because it's car culture brought and then coffee yeah. And it's what you guys have built out for your workspace is very welcoming. And I think it's pretty cool. Uh, we really are. Like, I think coffee is a great, uh, a great way to bring people together. And, James really uh, likes a 911 with six extra shots in it. <laughs> oh my God. They tried to kill me before. <laughs> <laughs> before carding. And that, that was my I think leg up. To do that now. He can't win if he has to run to the bathroom. Good that's thinking. Right. But I think that's true in general. I think in life right now, like it's, I think it's amazing the technology we have at our fingertips to, to be able to do something that spreads to a lot of people. But I think backing that with real life experiences is, is important. So that's my, that's my focus. I think that, uh, I can probably speak for, for all of us here, but, um, yeah, I'm bummed for you that you didn't make it huge in racing, mm. but I'm stoked that you didn't because we get to see all the yeah. stuff that you've done to bring car culture and just culture in general to people yeah. in, quick 
30 second to two minute snippets that, that, I mean, I've been able to watch and just, I mean, blown, it's changed the way I watch things online and it's gotta be pretty cool to realize that you're a pretty giant chunk of why the entire world watches the way they watch. Well, thank you. Yeah. It's, I, um, yeah, I think it goes back to that kind of we're right where we're supposed to be thing, you know, and you can fight that and be bummed about the way that things turn out the way they do. Because, you know, it, but I think it all comes back to perspective and I'm very, very, very grateful to be where I'm at. And um, and I feel like I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing and have been the whole time as I look back on it. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty special. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thanks for letting me talk and share my experience. And, uh, yeah, this is all just a weird, you know, experience and game. And, uh, you know, I think sharing stories is the best way to kind of and mojitos. Make it make more sense. And mojitos. Um, shout to your mom mojitos. for goodness gracious. Cheers. Thank Cheers. You, Thank you guys. Let's go race. Let's do it. Yeah, I'm super down. All right, y'all. That was the show. Thanks so much for watching. Hey, if you like that, do us a favor. Check one of these out over here. We'd appreciate it. Have a good one. Never do this. Middle-aged white guy should never do this. No deuces. I've never done that before in my life, and today I've done it twice. Girl, doom, 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 doom. You'll be a woman soon. There you go. That's my Pulp Fiction imitation remix.